<laughs> we have the best record of yeah, Dimetrodon in, sure. in the world, right here. Dig up the matrix of facts, historical facts, right here. Now the Craddock bone bed is on the Craddock Ranch and it outcrops in a little town, north central Texas, Baylor County, called Seymour, Texas. And it's sort of a sleepy town, it doesn't seem like much. I think the population at this point is maybe 2,000. We're down to about 2,800 now, I believe, like all small communities were on the down. Can't stand enough about Seymour. I don't know how to describe Seymour other than to say, when you say it's your hometown, it is home. Seymour is a, a nice spot to come back to. It certainly beats five o'clock traffic on North Central Expressway in Dallas. You know, there's some downsides, you know, but uh, I've always enjoyed the association with the community. I was glad to grow up in a town like this. In Dallas, or in Houston, you gotta plan on 30 minutes if you gotta run an errand and get something done. In Seymour, you gotta plan for 20 minutes because you get there in two minutes, but then you gotta spend the next 15 minutes. Well, how you doing? How you, you know, how's your mama and them? And for us, it's a neat part of the world. I've been a Seymour native for four, almost five years now, so. I don't miss the big city at all. I, there's a few things I do miss, and I talked to some of your friends about this, is that, the, uh, the amount of different types of foods is, is a thing I miss the most, for sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely don't miss the traffic, don't miss uh, the co you know, congestion, but uh, it's one thing to, to drive to work in a minute and not have to worry about traffic, but it's another thing to be able to see the sunsets and sunrises every single morning uh, and uh, know that uh, you know, the natural history is literally uh, right out your back door there. Uh, that's uh, something that cannot be uh, compared to anything. This outcropping contains probably the first apex predator, which is this guy right here, Dimetrodon. All we had at this museum was a picture of Dimetrodon, and we wanted something more. In fact, we wanted to have a mount, we wanted to have a skeleton of Dimetrodon in our collections on display. So where were we gonna get a Dimetrodon? And of course, one of the first things that popped into my head was, the Craddock bone bed. Um, right now we're finding a tremendous amount of dimetrodon. We found like um, the very, very long rib, like the longest one that we found here. Um, about two days ago, we found uh, parts of a, um, a jaw, the lower jaw specifically. And I think that there's more of the lower jaw in that jacket behind me. And um, I'm still finding more below the, the jaw that we found. So, and then next to me, those, those are the post oak kids that are, are here with us as well. We've been coming out here for now six years. The first year we brought one student, then we brought five, and now we're at 10 and pretty complete. And so we bring them out and we train them and teach them a little bit about what paleontology field work is about. Some of them end up going back and working with the HMNS in the paleo lab, doing fossil prep, scientific illustration, sometimes docenting in the museum itself. We've just had a full group come out every year. Everybody's really excited about being here and enjoying it and likes learning about field work. You know, the potential dinosaur hu hunters that, you know, when they were six, they wanted to go hunt dinosaurs, find out what it really is to be out in the field and the kind of work and, and that 90% of work in any scientific field is drudgery. And then you get the 10% of excitement of finding something. And so they kind of get that and they have to work through the kind of boring tedium and learn that you, it's not all excitement all, all the time like you see in the movies because you see the movies that are only showing the hot shot best stuff. So I think um, getting a feel for the field, getting a feel for the field work, getting a sense of what it's like to work beside experts and see what they're doing so they really get a sense of 
what fossil prep people do because they see the lab. They really get a sense of what prospecting is in the paleontology field. They know what careful digging is. They learn techniques that may not, they may never be a paleontologist again, but if they're an archeologist or they're a scientist of any kind, that kind of careful, meticulous work that you have to do minute by minute plays out in lots of different um, skills that they can take elsewhere. So it's, it's about skills, it's about content, and it's about figuring out what you want to do in your life. They find something every time they come. May not be very big, but they find a lot of stuff. And the kids are tickled to death to find what they do find. Um, we're currently digging up a Dimetrodon spine. Yeah. We yeah. just finished mushrooming it, so that way we can pull it out. It's supposed to weigh about 500 to 600 pounds. Yeah, so basically we're going to take this casing, take it out of the ground and then flip it and then they're going to take it back to the lab and work on it and clean it off. This is the Whiteside Museum of Natural History Fossil Preparation Lab and uh, it's one of the biggest labs that we know that's accessible to the public. Uh, so most of the time when you go into a prep lab, it's behind glass, which we do have. Uh, but we allow everybody to come into the lab and actually use these microscopes and, and actually get their hands dirty, learn how to prep fossils. Uh, we try to make the prep, prep lab experience as interactive as possible. Uh, and that's really the only way to go these days with a museum is that you have to have your hands on just about everything to learn something. This museum has been a big plus big plus for Seymour. Mr. Whiteside was very generous and donate and giving and supporting. Can't say enough about Chris. He has worked his little tail off, but he loves what he does and he's very efficient. I can't say enough about him. He, is, he has built this thing and he has been wonderful for Seymour. Uh, the quarry was, was discovered in 1910 by some guys out of Chicago and uh, originally what they did was they dug very quickly and uh, ignored a lot of fossils because they were looking for uh, the good stuff that will display quickly essentially they're trying to fill these museums extremely rapidly so for us we're digging a lot slower we're looking at the small things and the small things are actually just as important as these big big bones uh, so we've seen lots of little tiny jaws and skulls of animals that have never been described before because nobody looked hard enough for them uh, so we're looking for the things that the old guys missed, you know, a hundred years ago, and we're seeing a lot. Um, and that's adding to the story of these animals living on land, that they're not only dominated by these really big guys, but there's a lot of little tiny things that are living here too that are going to survive the big extinction in 60 million years, and then dinosaurs are going to show up just shortly after. So we're seeing the little tiny things that survive to become the first dinosaurs. Uh, so, you know, having the chance to have a museum in Seymour to actually keep the fossils here and finally give the public, you know, a chance to learn about these things is a big deal for them culturally wise as well. To get kids in here who have lived their whole lives and all of their generations of family have been, you know, growing wheat, raising cattle, and all of a sudden we have a museum here that is studying, you know, dinosaurs and non-dinosaur fossils. So none of these kids who have ever touched fossils or done anything like that before realizing that they have interests in stuff like this. Uh, and so changing the uh, cultural aspect of their future for what they're going to do with their lives has been a, you know, pretty eye-opening experience for us. Uh, to have kids come in here who now know they want to do something in the science field. So uh, that's, a, that's a big deal. Uh, if you're a Texan, and I'm not a native Texan, I've only been here 30 years, so it still doesn't count. I'm not a native Texan, but a lot of native Texans are kind of a little arrogant. And they do think that Texas is the center of the world. Well, the irony is, at this point in the Permian, with Dimetrodon, Texas was very close to being the center of the world. And of course, that also makes this thing a prototypic Texan. So. This was in Texas before Texas was Texas, but uh, these things were the apex predators at that time. So the old name for these guys were mammal-like reptiles. They now call them synapses, but they have characteristics of mammals. They also have characteristics of reptiles. So this is the origin very early on uh, of mammals, of what ultimately we are. 
and you find that contained in the rock record, Baylor County, Texas, not far from a little town called Seymour. So I found the lower left dimetrodon jaw and then underneath that there was um, a chop zone which is really just, it's a place where you can see that bones have just been chewed on. So there's like a bunch of different bones and they've all been chewed. Um, and they're just kind of in disarray and not in any particular order. Um, and that's important for seeing that a dimetrodon is actually like mammal-like. That's a mammal-like characteristic to see chew marks and things like that. Because dinosaurs didn't chew. They, they tore and they swallowed and they had gastrolus in their stomach. So um, dimetrodons didn't have that, which is one of the things that makes them more mammal-like and gives them mammal-like characteristics. Um, so that was important to find. And then underneath that even, we kept going down and we found more dimetrodon skull, um, which was amazing. Um, and I was just lucky. I was reaping the benefits of other people's work that they had been doing because I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, without these guys, we wouldn't have just about anything walking around on land. You know, we're walking because these guys learned how to do it first, the things that we're digging up. Uh, so the dinosaurs are important, but these guys are more important. And I think that's important for the scientific community to see that this research is being done uh, because there's not a lot of places in the world that you can see this stuff. Uh, see the evidence of those transitions from the, you know, the aquatic dominant creatures to the terrestrial dominant creatures. This is where it all happened. So there's a lot, a lot of different stories that come out of this. Uh, we look forward to uh, collaborating, of course, with the Whiteside Museum. Uh, we have a lot of the same data set, so it's been a, it's been a lot of fun uh, working with them. And of course, working with Dr. Bacher as well. So it's having Dr. Bacher involved in this process has been uh, just a wonderful thing. And a lot of people don't know that his uh, original, some of his original work when he was a student was in fact on the Craddock bone bed. And it was just very ironic uh, when we started this out, that even though he had studied this stuff and he studied the fossils in drawers, in museums, all around the country, he never actually been to the Craddock bone bed. So it was kind of exciting to, to be there with him when we went and uh, we started uh, excavating here and having him as part of our, our the process and part of the team that uh, is excavating here. When you come to a museum, a lot of people tend to think of things as being very static. So you come into a paleo hall and you see a skeleton that's sitting there and they'll be labeling that'll tell you about the, the, the Tyrannosaurus rex or the, or, or the Dimetrodon or whatever fossil you're looking at and it'll describe to you things that are known about it, uh, things that are accomplishments of science, things that we've, we've done. But what I really like about labs, I love working at museums and I love the teaching lab that we have here, is it's not all static. So the excitement of this is that new discoveries are made here daily.